Hello everybody, we'll be discussing basic transfers today in this lecture. There are two chapters in your Mobility and Context textbook, so make sure you review that material. Uh, in addition to supporting what we're talking about uh, today, this will also give you fill in the gaps for the written exams coming up. Um, so we are going to talk through, in essence, the big uh, effort of today's lecture is to discuss squat pivot versus stand pivot transfers. Uh, we will cover also transfer board transfers and talk about body mechanics and so forth, but our main focus is differentiating between squat pivot and stand pivot transfers. Uh, and so in essence, a transfer, for those of you who have not spent uh, a great deal of time in the inpatient setting, is helping a person move from one surface to another. And that takes on many different uh, shapes and sizes depending on your patient. Uh, but often patients are what we call very low level and relearning these basic mobility skills. Other times they have just become weak and we are supporting them temporarily while they regain their strength and so forth. Um, so as we're considering our patient and how we are going to intervene on their behalf and help them move from one surface to another, obviously we're going to look at the strength they have and also the motor control and coordination uh, if there are any range of motion limitations sometimes after uh, a surgery like a total hip replacement they may have certain hip uh, precautions uh, and if they've had spine surgery or some other uh, background that that may affect their ability to move uh, weight bearing status we've already discussed that a little bit uh, uh, Pain, of course, is a factor, their balance, their endurance, their, and I often like to use the term activity tolerance, often will be diminished for many different reasons. Uh, and another bullet that's not here that kind of goes with all of these is what we call trunk control, just the ability of a patient to control their trunk in space, uh, sometimes with uh, severe deconditioning that may be an issue after a stroke or a head injury. They may have uh, weakness on one side of the body, which may affect trunk control. And so if we look down at the very bottom here, we see a few examples of uh, if a patient's non-weight bearing. That's definitely going to affect the way we approach uh, their transfer. If they have one-sided weakness or hemiplegia after a CVA or a stroke, then that will all affect how we approach them and the same as we've talked about uh, hip replacement or a spinal cord injury. So we want to, uh, of course, take into consideration what the patient desires, uh, what they're returning home to, if they're an inpatient with us in the acute care setting or, or, setting or a skilled nursing facility, uh, what will be their set up when they get home. These are all things that may affect how we teach them transfers and, of course, uh, their desires and their ability to return to their prior level of function. So a review for body mechanics. Uh, the last bullet point, last two bullet points, I guess, are very important. We want to keep the center of gravity of the patient and ours as close together as possible and we need a wide base of support. Um, low back injuries are very prevalent in healthcare workers and transfers are one of the primary culprits in uh, being potentially dangerous and injury causing. Um, and in addition to a wide base of support, at times we want to anticipate how the transfer is going to progress and sometimes we will position our feet uh, and maybe even have a split stance to be able to anticipate the movement that will occur during a transfer. Uh, on Monday, December 14th, we'll have the chance to practice all of this in person, but this is uh, to give you a little bit of background before we get to that lab. So once again, we want to engage our core muscles, maintain spine alignment, avoid twisting or rotating our spine, and use those bigger muscles. Use our glutes, our quads, uh, instead of our back muscles to affect a transfer. And so uh, 
we want to look at the patient's range of motion, strength, pain, uh, before we consider which transfer is going to be the most appropriate. Uh, cognitive status, are they able to follow directions and understand what we are doing and why? Uh, movement dysfunction, do they have issues with motor planning? Uh, are they impulsive? Are they uh, lacking coordination? All of these will be uh, areas for consideration. Um, and so uh, sometimes we may want to uh, do some sort of assessment in addition to just looking at their range of motion and their strength before we transfer a patient. Uh, sometimes having them just move from sit to stand and then uh, sit, you have the ability to sit back down immediately if need be. So you haven't really left the safety of the wheelchair or the surface where they're sitting. You just have them stand up to see how, how they tolerate that, how their balance is, and if there's uh, any kind of an issue, you can quickly uh, return them to the seated position safely. Sometimes we'll have them do some marching. Uh, once you have them standing, you may have them step forward uh, with one foot and then step back with the same foot. So these are all ways to maybe screen uh, how they are going to respond, how they're going to tolerate uh, the beginning of a transfer without actually conducting the transfer. So levels of assistance. Uh, I'm slapping the table. This is definitely an area that will be asked on quizzes and or exams. But this refers to the amount of assistance that the physical therapist or the caregiver is providing. So if we are providing less than 25% of assistance, then that is uh, deemed minimal assistance or min assist. If we are doing roughly half the amount of work, and you see it falls all the way between 26 to 74, then that would be moderate assist. If we're doing 75% or more of the work, uh, that would be max assist. And then there's maybe another layer uh, of assistance called uh, dependent, where the patient is really doing, uh, it's kind of the same as a max assist, dependent transfer and max assist may be used interchangeably. Basically, the patient's doing, uh, able to help not at all or very little and that would put us in that top category. Uh, there are other categories of assistance, such as contact guard assist, meaning we just have one hand on the patient. We're not actually lifting or moving, but we have uh, a hand, for example, on the gate belt because we don't have that comfort level that they can be completely unattended. And then standby assist is we're wanting to be close, but we do not feel the need to have a hand on the patient. So those are all levels of assistance. Um, so as we're preparing for a transfer, we want to anticipate everything that's going to happen as we move the patient, for example, from their hospital bed to their bedside chair or to a wheelchair. Uh, if, they're, if we need equipment like a gate belt or a transfer board, we want to have that all ready. If they have an IV or if they're on oxygen or if they have a catheter, we need to make sure all of that is prepared before we transfer them. Of course, if they're wearing a hospital gown, sometimes we want to put another, that opens in the back. We want to sometimes put another hospital gown on facing the opposite direction, up, opening in the front. So now they have their, their front and back covered. Uh, we may use a bed sheet just temporarily as they're moving, for example, from supine to sit and then uh, just to maintain their dignity. And of course, the primary consideration is safety, not only of the patient, but of ourselves as we're planning a uh, transfer. So communication is very important with transfers. We want to make sure that everybody involved understands what they are going to do, including the patient. If you have a technician helping you, everybody is clear uh, before we begin the transfer of what their role is going to be. Um, if a patient is dependent or, as we said, a max assist, then we want to make sure that we have them uh, prepared uh, before the transfer happens. And for many patients that are dependent or max assist, uh, it can be a very terrifying idea. You can imagine if you were unable to help at all with moving from the wheelchair to the bed or, or the other direction, that could be uh, terrifying for the patient. So we want to make sure that they understand very clearly what's going to happen. Um, and so if, if there is some sort of assist that's needed and the patient is going to help, then we want to explain that to them. We want you to, for example, we may say, 
Mr. Johnson, as we move from the bed to the wheelchair here, we want to make sure that you push down with your legs, keep your back, uh, avoid bending over too much, and use your leg muscles. And with your right hand, I want you to reach for the wheelchair. And as we are moving, I want you to help pull yourself into the wheelchair, something like that. And so everyone understands what's going to be happening. Um, gate belts, you are very aware of these. Uh, we've talked about them quite a bit. And it gives us uh, a great option to control the patient's center of gravity. Um, obviously, if a, a patient is weak or obese, uh, the, both of those may be situations where we have difficulty uh, holding on to the patient. The gate belt gives us um, a nice way to do that. As we've said, a uh, gate belt does not eliminate any possibility of an accident or a fall, but we just want to make sure that we are uh, using them when needed and using them appropriately. And that bottom bullet describes the fact that in many facilities, you, it's a policy that they must be used with all patient mobility. So I think this is review. We've talked quite a bit about uh, keeping our body, our center of mass close to the patients. So we, want, we are concerned not only with the height of our center of mass compared to the height of the patient's center of mass, but also the proximity. Uh, as we discussed last term with body mechanics, that decreases the lever arms and the amount of work that we need to do. Uh, obviously, gait belts need to be very snug on the patient, especially if we are providing moderate or maximal assist. Uh, we're really going to be relying on that gait belt, and so a loose gait belt is not going to be effective. Um, and even though we are using the gait belt, often we will uh, use the gait belt to hold on to the patient. And so uh, it, that's often not our only point of contact. You know, in addition to holding on with both hands, for example, to the gait belt, we are able to squeeze the patient's pelvis and uh, hold them that way in addition. And as we talked about, uh, palm up grip is the preferred and safer way to hold on to a gait belt. So a lateral transfer is often referred to also as a horizontal transfer, is basically just moving uh, between surfaces that are of similar height. So a bed to a chair, a chair to a wheelchair, uh, in and out of a car, uh, on and off a toilet or a tub bench. Uh, and so this is, uh, a trans this is a transfer where the patient's not able to stand up on their own, for example, and walk to another surface and sit down. So we are moving between these two surfaces um, and so we'll, we'll demonstrate this on Monday in lab as well. So a transfer board or a sliding board is a tool that can be used to basically kind of bridge the gap that you are trying to uh, span when you're moving, for example, from a, a bed to a wheelchair or a wheelchair to a bedside chair. Uh, and it just, if the patient is very weak and unable to support their weight, kind of when you're in that space between the two surfaces, the transfer board can be helpful. Even though the, it is sometimes referred to as a sliding board, we often uh, want to discourage the use of that term or the way we think about it. Remember we talked about in positioning and the pressure injury lecture that skin with patients can very often be fragile. And so we want to avoid sliding along any surface uh, so that we don't put the skin at risk. And so often, even though that board is bridging the gap, a patient may, may lift their hips and move six inches to one direction and then sit back on the transfer board, raise their hips again, move another six inches and sit back down on the transfer board as opposed to sliding along it. That, that would be preferred. So a uh, transfer with the transfer board, this will be this is described in the textbook, and there are some sequential photos, uh, and also some of those supplemental videos that are available to, available to you through the textbook will be helpful for you to visualize this. But we're basically having the, the wheelchair and the bed positioned correctly, so there's a slight angle. The patient leans away from uh, the surface that they're heading towards to get the board placed underneath their ischial tuberosity and then basically moves along that transfer board until they are uh, safe in the, in the new surface. Uh, this concludes part one.